continuing our conversation on resurrection of ancient goddess wisdom my next question is uh, a little about evolutionary temple of evolutionary emergence and uh, the feminine teachings along with it uh, going to the next question conjoining that is what are the themes of age of aquarius and the necessity for women to rediscover their core wisdom and essence okay uh this is a great question and actually i think that the answering about the temple of evolutionary emergence will naturally flow into the second part of the question okay so the Temple of Evolutionary Emergence in, in November, as a matter of fact, November 11th, will be two years old officially as a 501c3 nonprofit religious institution in the United States. However, the process, excuse me? Congratulations on that. No, oh, thank you. Um, however, the process of building the temple is one that I've been involved in for a long time. And um, we've talked about some of the contributing factors. I believe that um, I believe that this has been my destiny, that I was not clear about my destiny. I knew, you know, some of what that was, but the clarity that has come with the Temple of Evolutionary Emergence, there was a lot of work that went into that. I'm saying that because the Temple of Evolutionary Emergence, how I came to the name, um, you know, how I came to understand what it was I wanted the temple to be able to do in the world was through my um, reintroduction with the mother, through the reintroduction with um, goddess worship, with the, the science was important. I could not have come to the conclusion that I did about the temple without having been a scientist first. When I took Ayurveda in medical school, I was an atheist. I had been an atheist for 12 years. And so it was my Indian Ayurveda teacher who talked to me as a scientist, but it was her classes that really had me re uh, reevaluate my position on the non-existence of a higher being. It was in medical school that I started to open up about the possibility of, you know, greater forces in our lives and destiny and, and these kind of things. The science was important for me to come to the conclusion. Now, to be to give you an oversimplistic definition of the de the temple of evolutionary emergence, the temple of evolutionary emergence. This it part of what led to the name of the temple was a uh, um, theory that is uh, a part of Chinese medicine gynecology. In traditional Chinese medicine. The uterus, as an extraordinary vessel, is called the lower palace. Hmm. It is called the lower palace. The uterus is called the lower palace. The place that prepares the coming being, right? And so this concept of the uterus as this sacred place that is preparing the incoming spirit for its journey into its physical life, I was like, damn, that's powerful. You know, the, the uterus is the lower palace. It's the extraordinary vessel that is responsible for both receiving and giving, right? I was like, damn, that's extraordinary, right? And so that being in my mind, right? This is about the, the medicine, the scientific understanding through Chinese and culture and worldview about the significance of the uterus and the birth giving process, the, 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 the childbearing process. I was like, okay, now as a scientist um, and not just a, you know, a scientist of alternative medicine, my undergraduate is heavy in the Western sciences and the Western medical uh, sciences, botany, chemistry, biochem, all of that stuff. And I'm a geek for that stuff. I love research. <laughs> I love laboratories. I love microscopes. I love all the nerdy shit, right? I love, you know, even though I'm a quote herbalist, I learned herbs through botany. I wanted to know what are the identifiable, identifiable active constituents in the plant that make the plant work in, you know what I mean? As well right. as the cultural, historical uh, understanding through observation of how these herbs work. 
I wanted to know both. And so having that background, having a very linear left brain Western scientific background, as well as now a foundation of traditional systems of medicine. When I started thinking, when I started incorporating spirituality into my medical practice, that is when bridges began, well, not bridges began to form, chasms began to be bridged, right? And so, you know, the whole concept of evolution, you know, the, the this idea that there is and in, there is a natural intelligence that's always analyzing a species' um, environment to produce the best of its genetic self and its offspring so that it can more efficiently adapt in the environment through which it is evolving. That's the evolutionary process. The outcome always, when functioning properly, always guarantees a better version of the previous self always analyzing the environment around so that it can adjust and evolve with the changing environment. The emergent process is when a particular evolutionary process is complete, the, the product produced has to emerge new, right? So for example, you think about a, a caterpillar that, you know, forms a chrysalis, forms a little cocoon, right? This is an, the cocoon is, a, the cocoon, the, the, the caterpillar, the going into the cocoon, the all the stuff that's happening, just like I was talking to you about the veil and the aliens earlier, we need hmm. a little baby in the veil, right? There's something going on up in here, right? And we can't see what's going on outside. The little caterpillar is doing its thing in the cocoon. And that is the evolutionary process. It's tight, it's painful, it's constricting. It, when you see a snake evolve from its, its previous skin, it's painful, it's constricting, it's like labor pains. But the guarantee on the other side of the process of the emergent process is that a better version of himself or herself will emerge, will break through, right? We are the same way. The evolution, the continuous ongoing evolutionary process and the ongoing emergent process, even as we're going through the evolutionary process. We do it every night when we go to sleep, when we fall into the black abyss of the unknown to restore our body, all the hormones are the neurotransmitters that are only produced when we're asleep in the abyss. We're given some entertainment for the night. That entertainment comes from our past lives. It comes from our subconscious, the pictures, the images, the dreams, while our body is restoring itself. It's recovering from the previous day's work and labor and trauma. And then when we open our eyes, first thing in the morning, this is the emergent process. The night, the eight hours, nine hours of sleep is the, uh, the evolving process. It's the evolutionary process. When we emerge new every morning, like we do, like the day that we were born, when we broke through the mother's veil, we wake anew. We wake every single day a better version of the we that we are than the day before because we've learned something new. We've met someone new. We've had some experience that we didn't have the day before. Every day we're better than we were the day before. But in a society that needs you to feel powerless, in a society that needs you to feel battered and broken and beaten, you can't have a philosophy like evolution is a guarantee. And the guarantee of evolution is that every single day you are going to emerge better than you were the day before. We dread grow, we dread aging because we see aging as something synonymous with being old and decrepit and useless in society unworthy of love, unworthy of human connection and affection. And so we literally grow worse every day, dreading the inevitable of the aging process. But evolution in every species on earth, from the microbe to the plant to the human, evolution guarantees that every day we are better because we're constantly learning something new that allows us to adjust and evolve in real time. And you can, the, our owners, our bosses, and our <clears throat> the people who have created an opportunity for them to perpetually exploit our fucking human labor, exploit our happiness, exploit our potential for something radical, they cannot afford for us to accept a philosophy of evolution is a guarantee of the mother to make us better than we were the day before. That's why I am convinced that all of these patriarchal traditions, every single one of them, 
is diametrically opposed to evolution. They're opposed to the science of evolution. They're opposed to the talk and discussion of evolution. That's why ritualistic practice and repetition of mantras is a must. This is how we've always done it. We've done this. We've done it this way for 6,000 years. We've done it this way for 5,000 years. That is a guarantee that you will not evolve, that you will not change, that you will not transform structures that no longer allow for the movement and the space for you to become bigger, for you to become better, for you to become healthier, for you to become sane. Do you understand? So that's why all Wait of these you say. And so Wait when you wins. are and when you are talking about how you are uh, you know, walking away from idol worship, girl, I felt that in my spirit. I was like, <laughs> yes. Yes. thank you thank you so it's much really for that because it has been like people look at i already look seem like alien to people because i don't do what has been done so far <laughs> so that's it's, one it's of a point the things. Of it's a point of heavy contention yeah. because i you know i have my beautiful tapestries of ganesha in my room you know what i'm saying i've got my Oya statues and I've got my Hecate, you know what I'm saying? I've got my little Lilith here, up here doing her thing, but they are not the focus of my okay. spiritual life. Good. They are the reminders of the evolutionary and revolutionary spirit of female deities. They are like, they are like, uh, they are like my cheerleaders in the room. Do you exactly. what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I wake up, I see so, them and they're like, yes, bitch, let's go. You got <laughs> this. Let's go. And but I am not sitting here prostrate, counting beads and chanting mantras on my knees in front of these entities. That's exactly that's what we difference. have to look at. Yeah. Maybe when I look at these beings like that and I feel they were just another civilization or probably they are the aliens. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I can, yes. I can. Yes. I can. Yeah. That. I, I accept that. So they're yeah, just I another civilization. That. And uh, if uh, this patriarchal system and so meticulously designed and everything is hidden about the feminine codes, then that gave me a thing like no. I at least I have to not at least but I have to change at, uh, from my side I don't know about the rest of the world I can't keep explaining and wasting my time on others uh, so I started doing it on my own and it feels great that, yep. <laughs> yeah. that's it listen Absolutely. who is I say it all the time who is for is who is for if it right. ain't for you if it don't resonate with you keep it pushing go on somewhere else with what it is you believe don't be trying to impose what you believe on me I'm doing right. the work in my body and in my flesh with the mother. I am doing the work in my body and in my flesh with the goddess. She dictates my behavior. She dictates only her. She dictates my behavior, how I move in the world. And then that will draw in those who resonate with how I live. They're like, oh, I thought it was just me that had these ideas and is like the oddball in my community or the oddball in my family. But there are other women just like me. There are other men just like me. There are other people just like me who are having the same experience at the same time. Now those people need to be coming together in spaces because the thing, I'm gonna tell you this, and it's the thing that I'm going off about all the time is we're staging a contest for the future. We are waging a campaign to seize ownership of the future. And the problem is, is that you and I and others like us who are having these conversations and, you know, and all of this stuff, we're sitting by ourselves in our homes. Meanwhile, preachers and religious leaders are in temples and in stadiums preaching to three, five, 10,000 people every week. And we are on Zoom calls in the numbers of 10 or 20 people having these conversations. We have to be staging a contentious contest with right. these ideas that still dominate the planet. Christianity is the largest religious population on earth. Second to them is Islam. Third to them is Catholicism. And fourth to them is Judaism. The, uh, and Hinduism is in there. And Buddhism is in there. These are all patriarchal traditions. And yes. so in the absence of anything that contends with these monstrous institutions. And I'm talking about notice, monstrous. Hold on. I'm talking about monstrous. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. I'm talking about monstrous in terms of size and number. 
if we do not have something out there in the world that contends ideologically, people think that these are the only options that they have. The goddess, people who love the goddess, people who believe that the mother earth is a sentient being waging a battle against a tumor that's plagued the planet. Those who believe in the goddess have to wage a campaign that draws in, that opens up an opportunity for people that is other than patriarch, the same old tired as patriarchal institutions that have created everything wrong with the planet in the first place. We, that's what we have to do is we have to create a contest. We have to stage a contest with patriarchy. That way people know that they, they have some place to go. They have something that they can go to. It has to be on that level. It can't be fringe. It can't Absolutely. be French. It has to be massive. Just right. like these motherfuckers have gone out in the world with missionaries and mission families and all of this stuff to, to win people to, to win people to their own destruction. These institutions literally shorten your life expectancy, baby. <laughs> they Absolutely. literally suck the life out of you, yeah. suck the joy suck the happiness, suck the sovereignty out of you. You will never be able to realize your full God self until these things have been exercised from your spirit. That's the work of goddess worshiping societies is to stage a real contest with the opposition. And we have not done that. Absolutely. And I believe- We are doing it individually, one by one. Yes. Yeah. I believe that the great conjunction, I believe that the stellium of January 12th of 2020, and I believe that Pluto's entry into Capricorn, uh, representing Pluto's uh, first return for the United States of America, are three major historical events that can finally give us a fighting edge, give us the tools that we need to wage a competition with our opposition. But and I believe that two years of COVID was giving us the rest and the confidence and the new downloads to be able to wage that contest. Now we have to have the courage to move on inspired thought. That whole thing we talked about in the beginning about taking these big, broad ideas and working with it with our hands in the real world to construct something new in the material world. Great. I believe that we have everything that we need to do that right now. Absolutely. So uh, just to add a little to this, uh, when um, when this came around stopping all the idol worship and all the rituals that were told to me, I literally stopped that. And then I only used to think about how how any goddess elements wants to speak or any female soul that has been having issues. I, I used to listen and feel their energy and build a compassionate this thing so that uh, what we call as ghost is neutralized. All they needed is some compassion and listening, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so that gave me a different perspective. And very recently, uh, especially when there are heavy planetary or uh, transits that are happening, and last year, I happened to charge a goddess photo that we, like my family does the ritual to. I did the energy uh, healing uh, and uh, good energy, this thing for that. But exactly after one year, uh, we I had a conflict in the home and I literally threw away the same poster of the goddess also. It was very, very shocking for me because then after two days, three days, now that the new moon thing has moved out, I realized it is time to come to neutrality. Five elements of nature is all pervasive and exists in everybody. So that was the indication that we have to really revert and really give that uh, importance to the five elements, not masculine, not feminine either. Otherwise, we are going to end up in this conflict of the masculine, feminine, matriarchy and patriarchy. So sometimes certain events in my life are like so uh, violent, but then there is always a lesson and healing, tremendous healing that comes around it, tremendous wisdom that I get, the downloads that I get. So <laughs> I kind of wield these two different energies and it becomes difficult for me to manage that much because I am an Aquarius and now this Pluto in Aquarius, 
I am looking forward to what showing up in my life. <laughs> so, yes, it's yes, not well, a it's moment the of the day, baby. What it's is a wonderful that? moment. I said it's a wonderful moment. It is not something to be apprehensive of. It's a wonderful moment. This this re uh, this re con uh, this uh, what's the word I want to use? Like this this meeting of Pluto and Aquarius on November nineteenth. This reunion of Pluto and, Aquari Pluto and Aquarius on November 19th is one to be revered. And all the language and all the narrative is all things scary and all things spooky. There's a reason for that. We should, I've been saying for four years, we gotta throw a party on November 19th. We gotta throw a party on November 19th. This is huge. And it is, it is one that we should welcome in a celebratory way. That's what I've been really wanting to do is a celebratory event, a welcoming in of the new age, a welcoming of this reunion between Pluto and uh, and Aquarius, between Oya and Shango, who in Orisha tradition are husband and wife of revolutionary radical transformation. Oya and Pluto, uh, I mean, Oya as Pluto and Aquarius as Shango coming together in this reunion for the first time in 248 years is one that we should be welcoming, not lamenting, not dreading, not fearful of, but because we have accepted somebody else's analysis of what the potential is, we're all wrought with fear and doom and right? And <laughs> that's not the energy that we have to move into the thing. We have to see this as the promise of a radical new that we now have the potential to lead and guide in the direction that we see fit. If we don't do that, then of course, the opposite is a potential as well. Those who are ahead of us in their understanding can take and wield that energy in their favor, which is always destructive. Correct. It's always destructive. Right. The destruction so. leading to creation. Uh, I think that is what has been happening in my life uh, with all these transits lately, last two, three years, uh, destruction and creation. And it's always coming up with something new all the time. So I can't even stick to one thing that this is it. There's this limitless flow of energy that is happening, the universal downloads. So quickly yes. going to our last question. Um, so we did speak about patriarchy, so you already answered that. Uh, the fifth question is, in what ways each woman, can we, each woman listening to us in this video can begin their discovery of deeper truths about witches, queens, goddesses, fairies that have existed before? Okay, so my first recommendation is a list of books. <clears throat> My personal position is every man, every woman, and every gender in between should go out and buy the great cosmic mother, rediscovering the religion of the earth. Whether you are an atheist or a scientist or a spiritualist or a Christian, anybody that is trying to change the world, this must be a book of primary importance in their repertoire. That is my personal position. Second to that is um, another great book, Pure Lust, Elemental Feminist Philosophy by Mary Daly, is a must. Okay. Right now, excuse me? Uh, I said okay. okay. Yeah. The next one is Beyond God the Father and Toward a Philosophy of Women's Liberation. Um, next to that, and I would say this is the last one. This is plenty to start with. Um, where is she? Hey. Oh, wait, I know where she is. Um, the next one <laughs> is The Women's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets by Barbara G. Walker. The Women's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets. Actually, there's one more. The Women's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets by Barbara Walker. This book is all the things. It's awesome. However, the disclaimer that I have about the Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets was written in 1983. 
and it is very um, European centered. There is not as much of a contribution um, as I believe that if Barbara Walker was her age then today and would have written this book, there would have been a lot more contributions by women of color, by native women, by Indian women, by African women, so on. I think there would have been, a little, I, I think that yeah. she, given the period of time that it was written, this is what she was working with. We didn't know as much then about other societies, cultural, historical mythologies, and so on. And I feel there's like that's book, the weakness of it. There's one book written by an Indian lady, uh, Rutu Vidya. Rutu Vidya is about the moon blood cycles and the temple uh, related things. Uh, yeah, that's one book from an Indian author. Uh, Sino, send, Sino Joseph. Send, Sino Joseph. If you can send me. Yeah. If you could send me the link, I would like to have that. And then the okay. last book, uh, the last book that I would say um, is for people who are looking for more African, um, African-centered contributions to this, the story about the goddess, about the origins of goddess worship, about pre-patriarchal um, implications uh, in history about the goddess. Then this book I like. It is a little hard to read, but it's mm -hmm. called the the Great Black Mama of Creation, right? By Suzar, and it goes through every culture, every society, every mythology. It's very short, but it is very very thorough. And then the last book is the Sibyls, uh, the first prophetesses of Mami Wata in the theft of African uh, prophecy by the Roman Catholic Church by Mama Zogbe. This is a radical book because this isn't as this isn't about mythology at all. This is about the actual oracles, the actual sibyls in um, in the Mediterranean, in um, you know, in Southern Europe, and the African origin of the sibyls and um, and the political campaigns to destroy them. Mm -hmm. This is Storm. Nice, Storm. happy to see you. Very good sign. Yeah, he's nosy. He ain't happy to see me. He knows. He came at the right time. <laughs> what he you came, doing? At, he came at the you? right time, I would say. <laughs> so um, anyway, so those are the books that I would start with. They um, they cover everything from history to mythology. They're good cross-reference books like Pure Lust and Beyond God the Father. I learned about through reading The Great Cosmic Mother. She references both those books a lot in the great cosmic mother that's how i found out about mary that mary daly was through the great cosmic mother oh, and okay. um, and also also um the women's encyclopedia of myths and secrets that's how i found out about that book was in the great yeah. cosmic mother so i'm in the process of trying to buy every book that she references in the great cosmic mother i'm in the process of trying to buy them all like the reference material the source material is great i'm feeling um, the so same that's the i will be doing that so, too <laughs> yes, yes. And it's just a good place to start because it's re it really condenses and makes easy the research process. There's also a website you should check out um, of a woman who has spent her entire life. Of course, she is white. She is a European woman. They still corner the market on information. But her her website is great. It's called suppressedhistories.net. Suppressedhistories.net. And her whole research is just what it says. It is about researching uh, and, oops, and uh, consolidating the hidden contributions of different types of women in history, whether she has a whole section on female revolutionaries in all the continents. She has a whole section on um, rebel women who, start, who were healers, women who were healers who became revolutionaries. So women who were like... Um, you know, like uh, more towards the Celtic, workers. Celtic culture, the Druidic Celtic women. Everybody, not just Druid, not not just no. Every culture, African, Native American, uh, Mayan. She she really goes in on everybody's culture. Like unlike the uh, unlike Barbara Walker's book, this this website suppressedhistories.net, She cut. She goes to New Zealand, the Aboriginal people of New Zealand, the uh, at the indigenous people of Australia, of uh, Fiji, everywhere there was a cultural story about the impact of 
especially we uh, female revolutionaries, female rebels, women who fought actual wars, China, Japan. She covers all the ground. Her site is awesome. It's awesome. She it's has awesome. books as well. She has. I, I haven't found any books, but I haven't found any books by her. But she has a ton of literature available for download on her site. Okay. She does. She has a ton of lectures you can watch on her site. She has a ton of papers that she's written that you can uh, that you can download off her site. Her site's great. All right. Dot net. Suppressedhistory dot net. Suppressed okay. histories plural. Suppressedhistories dot net. Okay. Suppressedhistories dot net. Right. Yes. Yep. Awesome. So any uh, any two more practices that you would like to recommend to women who want to go deeper on this discovery of an adventure of knowing about the goddesses on the planet? Um, I would say the other thing is once you get into these books, take notes, always write, um, right. always write with your hand, not typing, okay. with your hand, okay. write, okay? Right. That is, that is pen them out to me of the stop boy now you're doing too much uh, that is ten about to me of the weaving process right so when i go out dancing when i go to the club to go dancing i will literally take a little notebook with me in my purse like this and if and when i dance because dancing is ceremony for me some i have a download right there on the down on the dance floor i'm old so i'll forget it so I will sit down for a minute and write whatever comes to me while I'm dancing. All of this in this book, which is back to back to front, cover to cover, Phil. I've got four of these, Phil. Every single one of them I filled in nightclubs, <laughs> you know, going out on the town. You know what I'm saying? Write everything. Right. This Make is, note, ladies. Just, Make note to all the viewers, always write down the ideas and visions that come to you at any point of time, um, especially while dancing. Yeah. Especially while dancing. Um, I would say also, uh, you need to move. Now you're doing too much. Go, on. go back to life. He likes both no. of us. No, no. Yeah, <laughs> he likes much. both of us. Um, he wants to stay, I think. <laughs> and he is nosy. He's like, what you doing? I want to see. So get yourself a grimoire. A grimoire. So a grimoire is like in the old. Are you familiar with the term grimoire? A uh, little bit, but for the viewers, could you come again? Okay, let uh, me show you a more traditional one. A can grimoire, we do this in the a next grimoire? Can we do this in the next? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 